My name is Dennis Linthicum. For those of you who uh, don't know me or haven't seen me before, I travel uh, Oregon as the dirt road economist in Northern California as well, uh, specializing in focusing on economic issues. Uh, everything we do is got some sort of economic twist to it, e even if you will, jaywalking. Now think about how this works. You're about to cross the street. You see a bus coming. You decide it wouldn't be in your economic self-interest. It wouldn't be in your best interest to jump out right about now. Uh, although I do see kids with cell phones walking around aimlessly and I think, uh-oh, some bus is really going to cock them one day. But the point is we actually have economy built into our nature. And our nature says, determine what's appropriate, what's right, how to use this resource best, what to do to stay out of trouble. The other example in this jaywalking example is there happens to be a cop across the street and on the corner and just kind of watching cars go by. So isn't it interesting that none of us choose to step out and jaywalk in front of the policeman? Oh, it's not far. I'll go down to the corner and we go down to the corner. Now, jaywalking, you may or may not get a ticket depending upon w what the, the traffic looks like, but you've made a decision based on your immediate circumstances, your immediate surroundings, your time requirements, like I've got to get to that appointment or else, or I've got all day, I can walk down to the corner. All of these factors are things that the government cannot put into your brain. They cannot tell you how you're supposed to respond to this incident or that incident. The only thing they can do to kind of fake you along is provide you with incentives, which comes in the form of subsidies, tax credits, grants, money straight out of the bank account, money straight out of your Oregon Trail card, etc. And what they're subtly doing is buying allegiance. They're buying your allegiance to whatever program it happens to be. That allegiance comes in the form of some political phraseology that is quite polite and quite decent and even maybe delicate when it comes to same sex. Which of you is gonna walk up to Bruce Jenner and poke him in the chest and say, hey pal, you're a man? Yeah, yeah, look, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, yeah the, well, what's interesting is this is delicate, and this is something decent. We don't really want to bust him one in the gut. However, I remember him winning the gold medal and waving the American flag as a male, the, the gold medal winner for the male decathlon. This is no slouch. This is no guy who wasn't sure what he, whether he was male or female. And the children that he's fathered, interesting word for me to use, right? The children that he's fathered are now grown adults and it, engaged in their own relationships. And yet somehow by changing the vocabulary, we're a little bit confused. We're unsure. Who is, what is this? How does it work? What does the word gay mean to any of you? If I told you a story about a gay man that I knew, a gay woman that I knew, would that mean a happy individual, someone who was uh, carefree and fun-loving? Yeah, exactly. So, so all of a sudden, a, de a new definition has been implanted into our minds and we're using the new definition and we're afraid to go back to the old definition. In fact, the old definition has been destroyed. I could not write a novel about a gay young lady and, and have anybody know what I was talking about when I meant fun-loving or frivolous or carefree, right? All of a sudden, there's all of this weight from background definitions that people interpret when they read. So the things that we are getting blessed with may not be blessings after all, right? Because it's going to depend on how you weigh it out 
where do you put your faith? Where do you put your beliefs? Where do you put your heart? And that turns out to be one of the most important things that we face. This is a real weakness for the natural man that we know and understand in the United States of America. This is a weakness that we all carry with us because not all of us want to just pick a fight on every corner. It's natural to be decent, loving human beings. That's how we are in our family relationships. It's how you are with your spouse. That's how you are with your children. And although there are a few of those people who have taken drugs or injected themselves in this way or that way and have fallen off the wagon, we still have a moral conscience which, which tells us what's appropriate and what's inappropriate. Our federal government and state governments have taken that notion and destroyed it for their own purposes. And this, this is what, what Ed's discovering over and over and over again. The words are being used like sustainable agriculture. And then it carries with it, well, what in the world is sustainable agriculture? And what does that mean? One of the items, actually, I'll go back two slides here. Look at the very first item on this UN agenda for the world's uh, summit on sustainable development. The very first item is poverty eradication. They're not talking sustainable in terms of how to grow a crop with the limited water resources that you have, or how to raise the best uh, blueberries, or how to raise the bef best beef. They're not talking about sustainable development in light of agriculture, green beans, and bananas. They're talking about sustainable development in terms of the social and economic platform that is, has been guiding us for centuries, especially here in the United States of America. The platform we have been using is a platform based on liberty. You can do as you please with your own property, and you've got to keep your mitts off of his property. And that is slowly being eaten away by the progressives and socialists, the, the, um, the humanists are rampant on pursuing this goal for destroying the traditional concepts that you and I carry with us as we, um, as we navigate our world. Anybody here know what this is? Yeah, yeah, I heard a, 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 yeah, it's a torpedo. This is actually the, um, the Mark 48 ADCAP Advanced Capability Torpedo. And I put this slide up here. You'll see that it went into service in 1988. And I worked on this project from 84 to 88. And I'm not telling you this background like, you know, I'm a, a Navy guy. I wasn't a Navy SEAL. I was never actually in the military. I did not blow up any vessels, and I'm not probably going to blow up the local library either. But the, the point is we, we had to get the technology that we were looking for in, in the 80s, and Hughes Aircraft Company and their missile systems group was developing guidance. I was a programmer. I've been in software all my life. And I wasn't one of these guys who was bolting things together and deciding which place different parts of this puzzle went. There's a fuel tank. There's a warhead. There's a, actually a gas piston driven engine inside of this. There's fuel storage. Uh, there's guidance passive sonar and active sonar. When this 19-foot fish misses its target, it goes to sleep. And it bobs around out there until it can find that signature again, and then it starts up and pursues the target again. It has a range of about six miles back in the day. Today, it may be better than that. But anyway, what I was responsible for hasn't got any of the fun stuff associated with it. So I'm sorry to disappoint you. 
what I was responsible for was the database design for as built, as designed, as configured, as run. We designed this thing to look like this on the platform. This is what the blueprint looks like. This is what the engineering specs call for. Now we're going to put it together and pieces may or not fit right. Your home maybe went through that. I built my own home and we had the blueprints and we got them approved and they give you a little bit of freedom, not a lot of freedom, and we change things all over the place. I'm not gonna do it that way. I'm gonna do it this way. I'm gonna do it that way. So you've got a design. You've got changes that get implemented. It gets reconfigured, re-engineered, and then you build it and you see how it works. And maybe it's not so good to put that bathroom right in the middle of the hallway that goes to the back bedroom because people have trouble get, you know, passing through that zone. So you decide that was a bad move. Let's put the bathroom over here and you get it out of the way. In this ad cap environment, we did the same thing. There's as designed, as built, as reconfigured, as run. And then you finally put this fish in the water and you let it go. We don't blow it up at the end of the day. We pull it out and then validate and verify that everything in that thing matches what they said they were going to do or what the original design called for. The reason I tell this lengthy story about the ADCAP por torpedo is because this is the way the federal government was designed. This is the way our state and low governments were designed. It all starts with you. It starts with citizens who are together in a community and they decide you know what, rather than each of us sitting up all night with our shotguns in our laps and having trouble staying awake, all 50 homes in our neighborhood, we should have a local sheriff. We'll hire one guy to walk the neighborhood or ride his pony or whichever it happened to be, and he'll be our, quote, local sheriff. And he'll stay up all night. And the rest of us can go about being productive in our machine shops, in agriculture, in computer technology, whatever, and we'll delegate that specific job to that guy. And then localities conglomerate, create states, conglomerate, create a federation of free and independent states. And it, we go up the triangle with less and less authority. That's why the triangle's shaped the way it is. The base is large because that's where the power should reside. The tippy top is very small and minute. And yeah, it yeah, should be. It, that's exactly where I'm going. Yeah, yeah, you know exactly where I'm going. Uh, Madison wrote the powers in the proposed constitution. This is before it was ratified, uh, are few and defined. At the federal level, they are few and they're defined. They're very stringent in their definition. Remember, we were just having trouble with defining words. This is one of those definitions that's important. If we can redefine what is means, yeah, is means or is is, then we can redefine what few and defined means. And this has been happening. With those powers which remain to the states are numerous and infinite. Everything belongs at the state level. The um, They go on to say, they recognize a warning here, and Madison acknowledges the warning. He says, if Congress can do whatever is in their discretion to be done by money, the government will no longer be a limited one possessing enumerated powers, those specific, small, finite, enumerated powers, but instead will be an infinite power. And this is the printing press problem that we see coming out of Washington, D.C. today. They can buy your allegiance with money. 
and they are buying your allegiance with money. They're buying your children's allegiance with money. They're buying community allegiance. They're buying your commissioner's allegiance. They're buying city hall's allegiance. Everywhere they can print money and spend it, they are. And the result is this tragedy that we're seeing in front of us. Thomas Paine said, wait a minute, wait a minute, the government, if we give it these powers, will operate in an ambush, in an ambuscade. They will destroy state governments and they will swallow the liberties of people. This is a warning. Wait a minute, you guys, look at where the potential is on the downside. Following this in um, 70, uh, ex this is in 76, this is bef during and before the revolution. This is actually in the book Common Sense. Look at what um, happens in uh, Federalist uh, number 14, 1787. To make sure that this gets ratified, Madison says, oh, come on, the general government won't be charged with all of the power. They'll just, they won't make all the administrative rules. They won't be making and administering rules. I know they may make a few laws, but they're not going to have their hands in dictating how you respond and what you do. He, he says the federal government, its jurisdiction will be limited to certain enumerated objects that keeps rising to the surface over and over again. Those objects which concern only the members at large of the republic. So tell me then why we have a program for African Americans, for Asian Pacifics, for Vietnamese, for Chinese, for females, for females over 50, for females between 32 and 47, for it, on and on and on. Why all these various categories and what in the world makes anyone think that is appropriate use of our federal tax dollars? It's not, it's clearly not. This all gets dusted under the bin. Words keep getting redefined. And quite frankly, politicians have been lying to us for quite some time. The most obvious, and this is, quite frankly, this one just drives me crazy, is this from Governor uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now, so he's governor. He's not yet president of the United States. And let's see what he says. Congress has not the right to legislate in the matter of a great number of vital of uh, vital problems of government such as the conduct of public utilities who created the public utility venture with the uh, uh, rural electrification act that act was specifically chartered to take private power and nationalize it, and they did. This next sentence, uh, pu public utilities, comma, of banks. Oh, federalizing banks. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Are there any that are too big to fail? Any that are uh, just steaming along from their own juice, from their own power, from their own uh, savers who have earned and stored money within their vault and lending the little homeowners that want those economic resources for whatever purposes at some given interest rate in the marketplace. None of that exists. Today we have $18 trillion of debt that was never earned, never saved, never set aside, never cherished for anybody, for anything, there's no demand for it. The only demand that we have is that the Fed keep interest rates artificially low so that we can keep buying the stuff we want to buy. And it's working, quite frankly. When's the last time any of you went to bed sweating the details of how your grandchildren are going to pay $18 trillion in debt? Only one hand. Thank you for raising your hand. <laughs> <laughs> we have other problems. We, yeah, yeah. Well, be, be careful. I'm not throwing stones, right? I live in a glass house, too. 
so my point is this is the subtle nature of what's been happening money is the problem that we're faced with money is the problem because this printing press keeps rolling in the underground and these dollar bills keep spewing out the top he can, continues on of insurance of business of agriculture and a dozen a dozen other important features in these, Washington must not be encouraged to interfere. Now, we know that this, this was an out-and-out -out lie. As soon as he gained office, which is just a couple of months later, he did all of these things. These were already on his list. And the reason I put of government in red letters is if they're not vital problems of government, then... They're independent problems. They're private sector problems. He says we should. The federal government, Congress, has no right to legislate in the matter of a great number of vital problems of government. So he addresses them as problems of government, and then says we shouldn't address them as a nation. He was just actually buttering his bread and waiting to hand it out to people who were anxious to have part of the loaf. The, um, the item that somebody said, this triangle's upside down, and indeed it is upside down. This is what it looks like today. This is how it's been evolved. This is how it got changed from the original design to the as configured, to the modified, to the reconfigured, to the current built, to the current operational, and quite frankly, it's non-operational. It's top heavy. The federal government controls everything. States next, and they've got their arm in this game too. They're busy wrestling everybody to the floor. Local governments and citizens have this little private sphere of blue. That little private sphere, I, I turned from being a red letter Republican here to just kind of using red for communist um, or nastiness or human, secular humanists or whatever, and the blue representing the American ideal that you and I understand. The blue is the heavens that the stars of the free and independent states are planted on. You know that the 13 red and white stripes are the 13 original colonies. The blue is the heaven that actually sustains the 50 free and independent stars that represent the states. That bit of heaven is in your heart and soul and mind. That bit of heaven where those stars actually float comes from your community, from your citizenship, from your involvement, from your recognizing the tragedy that's happening. And that's what we're fighting for. We're fighting for that little bit of heaven that we see in the flag. This uh, cartoon, it, I thought was a great summary, so I included it here. I meant to have a, 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 a picture where I could say, thank you for coming tonight, and it was um, going to be my dog. We have a Bernice Mountain dog, and she happens to be sitting on top of the cat. And the and. <laughs> And she's all smiles, you know, and the cat, oddly enough, doesn't mind. The cat's there, got this little kind of happy face on her, you know, she's okay, she's fine. And that reminds me of how we are as a public. This gorilla, you know, this 100-pound beast of a... Birdies aren't gorillas, they're really attractive and soft and cuddly, and so I can't make fun of my dog, but is sitting on top of you and I. You and I are trapped under the weight of this beast. And we're trying to survive and we're trying to decide, is it okay for me to step out and cross the street or am I going to get busted? And when we become so afraid to step out and say, hey, enough's enough, all of a sudden, we're starting to be part of the spin. And when we're part of the spin, it's not long till we're down the drain. 
So Diane and I are traveling as the dirt road economist, trying to help people see this, recognize it, understand it. I use a lot of founders quotes and ideas because I think they're so relevant. They're relevant because this decency, this politeness, this delicacy that we're discussing can be used to foist or wheedle our liberties away from us. Thomas Jefferson said, in questions of power, whether it's Obama or Kitsab or Walden, in questions of power, let no more be heard of confidence in man, but bind him down, chain him down, bind him down with the chains, uh, bind him down from mischief by the chains of the Constitution. That document and its original intent and its original definitions are the things we need to latch on to. Because if you take a match to that, you'll get exactly to the slide that Ed was showing us that says, by the way, the forms of um, collaborative governance aren't part or adjudicated or set or documented in rules of traditional government. They're not the forms that we usually use. They're made up as we drive down the road. So that any given time you will be out of sync and I can bust you and I can put you where I need you to be until you see things my way. And this is a, a I, I make it sound like this is, you know, gi just this giant conspiracy theory. But back to the cat picture, there's this weight and we feel like we're doing okay. It's not that bad. But that's this generation. Let me ask you, what will it be like for your children and their children? And remember, if I borrow a million dollars to buy something next year or two years or 10 years or over the next 30 years, I have to forego a million dollars worth of consumption, a million dollars worth of purchases, because I've got to save that million dollars to make payments back to the bank. Not only do I have to forego the million dollars that I borrowed, but I have to forego interest on that million dollars over the next 20, 30 years and pay that back to the bank. So tell me, how many of you, raise your hand for me, how many of you are willing to force your children and your grandchildren to forego $18 trillion of consumption, building projects, highway funds, purchases during their lifetime over the next 20 or 30 years. Yeah, you may not have to worry. The next, these guys are the guys that are going to be harmed by what's happening today. Here, here's, the, here's the point. You have to believe in liberty you cannot allow this um, collective language and redefinition of everything you believe in take place within your community. Everybody here tonight can talk about their beliefs in the individual, in the man and in the woman who have made a difference in their own family, in their own community, their own business, their own world. This is a belief system. Now that we believe this, we build institutions that support our beliefs. For, I'll get to you in a second, for, for quite a while, we have believed one man, one woman. Sure, there have been sub pockets of more than one, you know, a couple of, a couple of honeys isn't half bad, etc. Solomon had a thousand wives and look what happened to him, right? So, and he was wealthy to boot. What could go wrong? And my point is, there's a belief system in this God-ordained principle that you have been created and you have been endowed with certain inalienable rights. And those rights come from God himself, not from government. 
not from the feds not from the state not from your commissioners they come from beyond now those rights promote you to build institutions that defend and support those rights so therefore we had an institution we called marriage and marriage became one of those traditional institutions it's been around since the beginning of time this is how to create stable families with healthy children and healthy heritage now look at where we are these institutions are getting taken away and your personal freedom is being sucked down the drain as well because you no longer have the freedom to decide where you build that horse shed on your back lot can't build it there why not the building department says you can't oh who created those rules you just have to go further yeah, right right Diane and I do, believe me. We, we, live, uh, we live 47 miles to the east of Klamath Falls. And as Ed and I were trying to create this slideshow, you should have seen Ed laughing at me as we would get disconnected over and over and over again because the cell phone, re, you know, cell phones just don't go that far uh, on certain hours of the day. And it's quite humorous to live out there. We also aren't connected to the grid and so if on monday morning if you heard uh there was uh, michael forston was on and he's talking about his book one year after a, a repeat or a sequel to one second after and one second after was a great book to read because they kind of deal with these things and in this version one year after he's dealing with if there were something as horrid as an emp <laughs> what sort of culture what sort of institutions what sort of beliefs we utilize to build a new america and he raises the question what if they're not the traditional beliefs i know love and understand what if they're entirely redefined and what if they're completely foreign to us because we thought marriage meant that and you and I also thought gay meant that, and now it doesn't anymore. So these are the ideas that he's raising in his second book. I, I'm, I haven't read it, of course, because it's not released, but I look forward to reading it, and that's off track. But nevertheless, your beliefs lead to institutions, and both of those are irrelevant if your personal independence and freedom is stripped from you. You've got to argue for freedom over and over and over again. If you're not arguing for freedom, if you're arguing for Republican victory, you're arguing the wrong platform. You have to argue for freedom.